Good morning, everyone. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within our Indigenous Initiative Office. Good morning. My name is Bernie Dunker, and I am the Associate Vice President Interdisciplinary Research at the University of Waterloo. I'm pleased to welcome all of you this morning to Research Talks, Innovative Research. University research has an impact on everyone in our community, and at Waterloo, we want to share our research with each of you, engage in conversation, and hear your questions and thoughts. We believe that society advances best when universities are connected to the community, industry, and policymakers who are shaping Canada and the world. This Research Talks event is unique in that it's part of a series called A Year of COVID-19. This is the second event in the series, and the third, with a focus on teaching and learning, will be held next month. Today, we have invited three University of Waterloo speakers to deliver a short presentation each. We'll then take questions from the audience, so I invite you to add them to the chat. If you're directing your question to a specific panelist, please include this with your question. We are also recording this session and plan to post it on the Research Talks webpage, as we've done with previous sessions. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about the three panelists who are presenting today. Sue Horton is Professor of Global Health Economics at the University of Waterloo, a Fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and the CanCOVID Theme Lead on Policy in Economics. She is currently serving as Deputy Co-Chair of the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics, which will publish its report in October. Her research includes the economics of non-communicable diseases, the economics of nutrition, and studies on poverty and women's work, mainly in low and middle income countries. Mark Serbos is a professor of biology at the University of Waterloo and the Canada Research Chair in Water Quality Protection. Current research in the Waterloo Aquatic Toxicology and Ecosystem Remediation Laboratory centers around the broad areas of ecotoxicology and integrated water resources management. Specifically, current research activities include evaluating the environmental exposure and effects of emerging contaminants, such as pharmaceuticals and personal care products in the environment. The development and application of new approaches for risk assessment and risk management of priority substances and effluents, including municipal and industrial contributions, are an area of ongoing interest. Dr. Claire Baldwin is the University Medical Director and practices family medicine at Health Services. As Medical Director, he is involved in development and maintenance of the Health Services clinics for students, including psychiatric services for students, and urgent care and first aid treatment for university employees as required by occupational health and safety legislation. Additionally, he is responsible for management and provision of medical consultation and services to the Occupational Health Department at the University. As a member of Campus Wellness Senior Management Team, he provides strategic leadership for health services and for the wider camp campus community to meet the need for preventative community health programming and to respond to health risks, including pandemic, epidemic, and other situations which threaten the health and well being of the campus community. Dr. Baldwin has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, a Master of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering from University of Waterloo, and a Doctor of Medicine from the University of Toronto. As well, he maintains membership certification at the College of Family Physicians of Canada. I'd like to welcome all three speakers, Sue, Mark, and Clark, to research talks and thank them for taking time from the schedules to join us here today. First, I'd like to invite Sue to tell us about her research. Oh, 
So just uh, bear with me for one second and I will get started my presentation. Good morning. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, for giving us me the chance to tell you a little bit about my research. So apart from making bad puns and bad jokes, um, I'm an international health economist. And so you can imagine that uh, life changed for me quite a lot. Um, as a result of COVID-19, because I am used to going to countries to do field research or to go to present to policymakers to try and translate the research that my colleagues and I do um, into practice. So here we are. This was January 7th or 8th on the shores of Lake Geneva last year and when we knew almost nothing about COVID. Here I am with uh, the 25 commissioners from the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics. Um, a, a topic that's become ever more important with the need for testing and for diagnosis of COVID. Uh, and we were anticipating a, a busy year where we were going to have a, a consultation with non-government organizations in March. We were going to have a writing meeting um, in Toronto in June and a big final concluding meeting in India in November. And obviously none of that happened. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how COVID-19 changed my research and then finish up with some lessons more generally for social science research on health. So for me, new research questions arose and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, some of the research acquired much more urgent significance related to COVID. I mean, a lot of health people had to pivot to do work on health because it was so new, so important, and there was so much we needed to know to do better. But some of our research, like the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics, still continued just in a different way. So I'm going to talk about uh, three different examples. So uh, the new, yeah, just trying to get rid of this sharing thing. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. Um, so uh, the the re the research I'm going to talk about. Here we go. Uh, Two weeks after the first lockdown in March of 2020, um, I was contacted by Jeremy Paulus, who's a very enthusiastic, mature, uh, soon to be PhD student. And he said to me, I'm really interested in working with this community uh, with uh, a syndrome called 22Q. Uh, and for family reasons, he is the father of a child with 22Q. He was passionate about it. And he also told me this Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction I think we'll fund a small project um, to, to do some research on this community. And there's been very little research on the community done. And he said, what I would like to study is what the impact of the lockdown is on this group. So that, you know, obviously we look at the effects of the lockdown on many groups, but particularly um, individuals living with disabilities are tending to be neglected. So I'm sure you've all heard of Down syndrome, which is um, problems with the 21st chromosome where people end up with an extra copy and it affects a lot of their health and their cognitive development. So the 22nd chromosome can also suffer from what's called micro deletions. So it's like little bits that are missing uh, and it can have very profound effects on people's health, uh, their emotional abilities and their cognitive uh, abilities too. So two weeks after the lockdown, I was so impressed by Jeremy's enthusiasm that we started work. We applied for the grant and we started to do some field work. But there were lots of challenges. How could we get ethics approval? Because the university was locked down. Okay, I should mention the only way I was able to do this is I just happened not to be teaching that term. For my other colleagues who were teaching, you know, pivoting to move all the courses online was already overwhelming. So that's the only way I could do this. But still, how could we get in touch with people to recruit, to interview? How could we do the interviews? And how could we do it in an ethical way um, to ensure that the participants could give uh, proper consent? So these are some of the ways that we met the challenges. Firstly, the university was prioritizing applications for ethics that involved COVID-19 and they uh, gave it obviously due process, but in a, an accelerated way. 
And Jeremy was able to contact uh, participants because he already was involved in organizations involved with 22Q. Um, and they were happy to publicize the fact that we were doing the study and to encourage people to participate. And indeed, um, those people living with 22Q were often very interested uh, to share their experience and their families also wanted to share their experience, you know, because they'd gone through the process of trying to learn about this condition themselves. Um, we only interviewed adults 18 and over just because it's more complicated to um, interview children, but we also interviewed in some cases the parents of these adults. So the next hurdle was how are we going to communicate with them? We're obviously not going to do face to face interviews. So we looked into video conferencing software and the university said, oh, we think you should use this, this and this. And we tried this, this and this. And it turned out, no, they were very clunky. You need something that people who don't have the software um, already downloaded can easily get in through their phone or through their computer into an interview. We didn't want to have any barriers to people's participation. Um, and also getting informed consent was an issue. Um, th there are cases where you can invite individuals to do research, but you have to be sure that they understand what they're getting into um, and that they are um, consenting in a way that's informed, you know, or otherwise you have to get someone um, who can, on their behalf, agree to participate in the research. Now, uh, it turned out it wasn't all that easy. There were studies on how to get informed consent on uh, people who were older uh, and a little bit about people with dementia, um, and, but we had to kind of make this up as we went along. I mean, we did find that the university process for um, ascertaining consent, we wanted it to be as easy and as straightforward as possible for the participants. So, you know, we wanted to do everything online. And then the university said, oh, no, you've got to get um, written consent forms. And I thought, no, that why, why should I have to do that? It's just going to make it more complicated. It's going to make it more risky, you know, that so we can't maintain their anonymity. Um, but in with much help from the research office, we were successful. And um, in the process, uh, we became convinced that making research more inclusive is a very important end goal. You know, I've included a, a short quote here from the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and in the end, we ended up writing a short checklist on how to, on our suggestion on how to do research um, on individuals living with intellectual disabilities, which um, is now in a collection at the University of Colorado in Boulder, you know, which specializes actually in research on natural disasters. Um, but I guess we, they, ex they include, ex they um, increase their ambit to include um, COVID-19 as a kind of disaster too. So we interviewed um, 11 individuals in depth um, on video. Uh, we uh, interviewed three men and eight women. Women were more willing to participate and come forward. It's not that there is a gender discrepancy in the syndrome itself. Um, and uh, they were, the majority were adults living with the 22Q, but we also interviewed um, some parents of the adults. Uh, and we got, they, these are the preliminary results, which Jeremy presented at a conference at University of Waterloo, and he's doing ongoing work about this topic. So uh, it's interesting to know, do, did the lockdown affect people with disabilities more or less than it did for, you know, average people in the population? You know, for example, people with autism, uh, you might think would actually do better under lockdown and doing things online um, because they don't enjoy social interaction the same way as some other people in the population. Um, so we found many common themes from uh, the community that we talked to. You know, obviously, uh, many of these would be common to everyone affected by COVID, um, but it was exacerbated um, by the fact that this is a group that needs more medical treatment. Um, some of them have uh, counseling for some of their anxiety issues. Um, some, in some cases, they often had much more contact with their parents 
than uh, the average person of their age. And one of the findings that interested Jeremy a lot was that driving was a real source of support and a feeling of freedom. And that was interesting for Jeremy because he actually works as a mature student for an insurance company, uh, which includes auto insurance. Um, so that's something he wants to pursue um, and to look at the issues about getting driver's licenses for people with cognitive impairments. So anyone who's interested in the topic, um, here's Jeremy's webpage and he's happy to, um, to talk to people and to encourage participation. So another project that I got involved in uh, was on the effects of the lockdown in South Asia. Um, we were obviously in Canada reading a lot about how uh, lockdown was affecting Canadians, but the effects are different in other countries. I mean, in Canada, we had a very large government effort pouring billions of dollars into income support to try and mitigate the effects of the pandemic on people's incomes. And to some extent that's, that, that's happened. Um, and although inequality has risen in Canada, um, the number of people using food banks has actually gone down because poor people have been um, supported with their incomes. But that's not the case in low and middle income countries. Um, so this was a study that was undertaken with some colleagues at SickKids um, in Toronto um, using a desk study, using data from the countries concerned. Okay, here's a complicated looking model, um, but the, the short explanation is that um, some of the things that were disrupted were health service coverage, food supply, employment, hence income, and education. And all of these interact to have effects on human capital, on child health, maternal health, child nutrition, education, income and inequality. So in order to uh, parameterize the model, we had to get data and we had to get parameters. Um, so we could use some existing models. Um, there's a model called the LIST model, which is well known for child health and nutrition, and similarly a uh, FAM plan model for births and adverse birth outcomes. There's a lot of literature on what ed the what interruptions to education do to um, earnings in future. There's a study from one country on the effects of lockdown on traffic deaths. Um, and we could draw on experience from other, other events, not identical to a lockdown, but with similar impacts like the 1997 Asian financial crisis and the West African Ebola outbreak um, earlier. Um, and we also had some actual data on reduction in use of health services. So this research was being undertaken around August of 2020. So um, we did the research on eight different countries, but I'm just going to focus on India, which is you know, the large majority of the eight countries in South Asia. So there were effects obviously on health services, and you can imagine there's gonna be impacts of that. And likewise, there were big impacts on education. And in Canada, you know, switching to online education, we know impacted uh, poorer households who have less access to technology. We also know it's had really adverse effects, particularly on younger children who are just learning to read, like in grades one, two, and three. And we know also it's exacerbated inequality because it's the struggling readers who have um, been harmed the most and who have fallen behind the most. So um, this was a picture from The Guardian showing that, uh, you know, if, uh, if online learning wasn't um, an option for you, there were in fact some outdoor schools set up. And this is in a slum area in Delhi. So you can see the slum in the background. Um, and it's also one thing that struck me was that all of the people in this photo are men. Uh, it's more difficult for, for families to send their girls to go and study in this kind of environment in India, as you can perhaps imagine. Okay, and here were some of the impacts. Uh, and you can see the biggest impacts, particularly of the loss in health services, were uh, affected newborns and birth and um, uh, unsafe abortions as well. Um, 
There was an increase in stillbirths as well. There was a smaller increase in child deaths. And in, for adolescents, it's not that I forgot the bar on that chart. It's just that there was um, effects that of increased deaths due to uh, untreated TB, malaria, HIV, et cetera, as well as increased deaths in childbirth for girls who were married earlier and had babies be really before they were ready. But it was offset by a projected reduction in road traffic deaths. If you have been in India, you know, you'll have some sense of what it's like on the Indian roads. Um, so this chart has some of the drastic numbers uh, that occurred. Uh, it was significant that children dropped out of school. Um, and that's particularly a concern for girls because of the way uh, that the family structure is in India. Um, so if your daughter is no longer in school, uh, then the family is very motivated <clears throat> to try and get uh, arrange her marriage. And once married, you know, uh, to start having children. So there are a lot of adolescent pregnancies. And you can imagine the inequities in this are quite strong. You know, the richer income quintiles are much more able to protect their children, use online learning. But the children of the poorest households are much more likely to leave school permanently, and it's going to scar them for the rest of their life uh, because their earnings throughout the rest of their life will be lower than they would otherwise have been. Okay, and in our report, we talked about some of the policy implications. We talked about smart lockdowns where you protect uh, the schooling of the youngest children as far as possible. You try and uh, make sure you orient policies towards poor households who are very adversely affected, you know, where possible to you, you think about poverty alleviation safety nets for the poorest. Uh, and uh, all things that Canada similarly considered um, and it's just interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago, a journalist phoned me up and uh, said, oh, I don't think your report has had enough um, press. You know, I'd love to talk to you about it. And I thought, oh, that's great. Um, so we chatted probably about half an hour. And so it turned out he was very concerned about lockdown. I think really what his aim was, was to show that lockdowns were a bad thing. You know, oh, what your study shows all these children died. But whereas if, the, if uh, we didn't, didn't lock down and the disease just uh, continued unabated, it would just really be the old people who died. So, you know, this, this wasn't an approach I was really in sympathy with. And I guess I didn't really understand his political motivation until after our, our conversation had ended. Um, and it's interesting, but horrifying to think about, uh, you know, what we wrote in the context of what's currently happening in India. Um, I think it would be fair to say the lockdowns have been anything but smart. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about um, oh, India, you know, did very well in the first wave. You know, lots of people had the disease. Uh, they were asymptomatic. The, the um, seropositivity rates are now pretty high. Um, India has you know, escaped this terrible scourge because we're already so uh, familiar with experiencing infectious disease, unlike, you know, you softies in the West. Um, and so, you know, we've done okay. And you can see it's just been a terrible uh, experience and it's still ongoing. It's a real tragedy. Okay, a couple more slides. Um, research, doing research differently. So I already had mentioned from my first slide what we had planned to do this year. Uh, none of that happened, um, but we decided not to give up and wait till the pandemic ended. Luckily, because, you know, we would have been a, uh, an 18 month hiatus. Uh, we just continued writing the report the three of us, the chair, the two deputy chairs, probably played a, had to play a bigger role in the writing than we otherwise would have expected. Um, and we are in the process of organizing a launch with FIND, the Foundation for Innovative New Di Diagnostics in Geneva. Okay, this is not our launch, the, the, the save the date here, but we are just doing the save the, <clears throat> save the date for our event, which should be on October 7th the day that the Lancet Commission is um, launched. And it's been a real learning experience um, as to how we're gonna run the launch. You know, I've been to these things before, you know, they're somewhat academic, although there are news people there. 
um, you know, they're a bit more leisurely, people are there in person. And I realize we're going to have to make the event much snappier and, you know, much more like a, you know, not, not exactly a TV show, but uh, edutainment a little bit, because all of us spend so much time on Zoom um, that the last thing we want is more talking heads. You know, we, it has to be varied, it has to be punchier, uh, all the things that we are not taught as academics to do. So, quick concluding thoughts. Um, so, the pandemic for me changed business as usual. And it's true for many other uh, researchers, especially in social science, because what we want to do is something that's relevant. I was shocked when one of my colleagues said, oh, my uh, family and my uh, research have been unaffected by COVID. I thought, how can you do research as a social scientist and not think about the effect of this enormous uh, event that, that we're going through? So the um, COVID has opened up new topics to do social science research, you know, such as doing more emphasis on research on uh, the people with disabilities, people with dementia, et cetera. Uh, and we've become so much more aware of the importance of inequality. Uh, perhaps COVID has accelerated the voice, the, the ability of those with less voice to gain a voice, um, you know, in, International work, we're always concerned about empowering people in the countries that we study to continue doing research on their own. And given that you can't travel to these countries, that's definitely been a direction that's uh, I think will continue. Um, yeah, and I'll finish with the last question. You know, you know, is how about zooming and zooming? Are we going to zoom off to conferences in the future, or have we all permanently changed our uh, perspective on that? Thank you again for listening. Thank you so much, Sue, for telling us about this vitally important work. So many different communities being affected by COVID in, in so many different ways. And yes, the inequities to, to sort of uncover and, and shine light on them and then look of ways of, of mitigating them. Thank you so much. I just want to, to say to the audience that uh, if you have questions for Sue, you can start um, uh, putting them into the chat line. We are going to have the question and answer period uh, at the end of, of the three talks. So uh, thanks again, uh, Sue, and we look forward to the, the Q&A session later on. Uh, and so now I'm going to invite uh, Mark Servos to give his presentation. Okay, so uh, you can hear me, Bernie? I can, yes. Yes, okay, fantastic. So thank you for uh, inviting me uh, here today and uh, to share some of the information. I'm gonna talk to you a bit about um, a unique uh, wastewater-based surveillance program that's been developed uh, in Ontario and all across the world. Um, so, so the big question though is how did a fish biologist who's working on ecotoxicology and chemistry um, end up doing SARS-CoV-2 surveillance for the province of Ontario. Well, essentially we had uh, established expertise in a variety of things, including contaminants of emerging concern. We we're looking at fate and effects of these contaminants in uh, watersheds, and we were doing environmental monitoring. And one of the techniques that we were using for environmental monitoring was a thing called environmental DNA. Essentially fish and organisms shed cells into the water and we can take a water sample and we can analyze it uh, for the DNA that's present in that sample. And then we can tell you what kinds of organisms are upstream uh, in that sample. So essentially we had all the tools ready and all we had to do was switch from watersheds to sewer sheds. So when people get sick with COVID, they, they pass it around with uh, aerosols, but they also discharge into the wastewater everybody poops. And so you have this release of the, um, of the virus or the viral fragments into the wastewater. It gets deactivated and um, degraded as it moves through the sewer on its way to the treatment plant. And then it gets dispersed in with other organic material. And ultimately it ends up in the influent of the sewage treatment plant. This happens to be the Kitchener treatment plant that we're looking at here. And we can measure the fragments of the virus 
in the uh, influent entering into the sewage treatment plant. So like I said, everybody poops. And so essentially now we have a tool to look at the whole community. We could sample a few people up to millions of people by looking at the wastewater. And it includes all the symptomatic people as well as the asymptomatic people. And it includes all subgroups, whether they get tested or they're reluctant to be tested. And it's independent of how the clinical testing is done uh, based on the protocols, and we've seen over time how the protocols have changed and how people's reluctance to be tested has changed. And so there's lots of biases in our clinical data, but the uh, wastewater is independent of those kinds of assessments. It has its own issues and, and, and challenges, but it's, it's different. And so it's providing an alternate tool for public health, and it's independently tracking trends in our communities. And it has the potential as well to be an early warning in some situations. So about this time last year, uh, we started preparing. Uh, we, we saw this idea in a, in a paper in the Netherlands and we thought, you know, we have all the skills. Let, let's go back in the laboratory and see if we can actually do this. So we started returning back to the laboratory in May and we started working on developing methods that we'd be able to apply this in our local communities. We were really interested in making a contribution back to our community in the middle of this um, pandemic. But working in a pandemic is very complicated, especially initially, uh, we had to deal with safety, going back to the laboratory, even just getting PPE. Um, uh, we had to work in a level two biosafety laboratory, which uh, we had to upgrade uh, in uh, as quickly as we could. And availability of supplies, we couldn't even order things. We couldn't get the supplies that we wanted. And so we had to work with what we had in our fridge and what we had um, to develop the methods initially. And then we had a limited number of people that we could access. And then internally, there wasn't the kinds of supports that we were used to having. And of course, we had absolutely no, no funding at all. Um, but we had a lot of people that were interested in helping us. So these are just a few of the people that played a key role. And some of them might think they didn't play a big role, but they really did. Everybody contributed in some meaningful way to make it so that we could pivot our research over to addressing the uh, pandemic. And I want to point out this guy. This is Roland. And Roland sprays and wipes down all the doors in the hallway of my lab three times a day. And I get to smile and wave at him uh, for the last year. And his role is just as important as absolutely everybody else. And there are lots of people in the university that have kept the research programs up and going, and we really appreciate that. So back to, to the SARS, and originally we knew very little about the properties and fate of the virus, especially in wastewater. We had no idea other than what we were learning from um, the clinical kind of work. From uh, from what we did know, we knew that we could target some of the genes in the SARS-CoV-2 and we could try to detect those in the wastewater. And so we targeted the N1, N2 genes that were described by the CDC. And this is part of the nucleocapsid of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so we developed the method um, and it took quite a bit of time. It took us a few months. Um, we had to collect the samples, and you can imagine if you're taking a nasal swab, it's 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 fairly straightforward. Um, but if you're dealing with sewage, you have this complex mixture, and you have to be able to collect the samples, concentrate it. You have to be able to isolate all the the virus or the RNA of the virus. You have to extract it, and then we have to be able to detect it. And so we used reverse um, transcriptase uh, qPCR. And we have all kinds of QAQC that we need to apply um, in this kind of technique. So it's, it's not a simple task, but we were worked through and we eventually came up with a method. But something that's probably even just as important is the relationship with the partners. And we had some enthusiastic partners at the very beginning. We had York Region and Peel Region who came to us and said they were really interested in doing this kind of surveillance. Um, and then uh, the region of Ontario came on eventually as well. And we've been reporting to these groups weekly since July and August of last year. 
and we meet with um, the operators of the treatment plants, the water managers, and um, public health teams, epidemiologists, et cetera, uh, every week to look at the data. And then we get feedback and we change what we do, and then we report back again. And at some point we were actually um, reporting daily to the science table at the beginning of the third wave. And then there's this international and national effort that we're participating in that's led by uh, public health and the Canadian Water Network. And the Ontario um, has developed a very strong comprehensive program for wastewater monitoring in the last few months. So we know that Peel and York were hotspots. They were hotspots right from the very beginning and they continue to be the hotspots. And we had introductions from the Canadian Water Network as part of their wastewater program, and they helped us facilitate connections with Peel and York early on so that we could start to apply the technique and support their public health. So here we are, these are the hot spots, um, York and Peel, and Toronto is, is the other obvious um, hot spot, uh, but Peel on per capita is one of the, the highest rates in Canada. Uh, and then we got Waterloo here, we live. So you can see the first wave in last May, we, we thought we were um, hitting a, a big wave and we had no idea what was um, facing us. And then uh, in the fall, we hit the second wave. You can see Peel much higher um, caseloads than uh, York. And then in Waterloo, we're fortunate to live in Waterloo that had a much smaller um, number of cases. Um, and then now is, is fairly um, flat, um, even though there is some increase. So let's look at what uh, we had. We had Peel Region, and in Peel Region, they got two true sewage treatment plants. They're draining about 1.4 million people. So we're going to take samples from 1.4 million people and, and try to do community uh, surveillance from these two plants on each side of the Credit River in, uh, in that region. And so this is the kind of results that we get. So this is the case report case reports, this is clinical cases on the left, and that's the blue in the graph. And you got the seven day, the dotted line here is the seven day uh, average. And then we've got our wastewater data. And you can see the wastewater data in the red is the seven day average again. And you can see it traces the clinical cases or reported clinical cases really well. And you see, as we went from stage three, we started, we, we reopened in the summer, and then we started getting more and more control. Uh, Peel locked down before the rest of the province. And so they've been in lockdown since November, uh, late November. And uh, you can see that we had this big increase at Christmas and the wastewater picked it up. And then we had the lockdown or stay at home order and everything came down, the wastewater responded. And then it increased again um, after we had returned to the gray. And then we had the lockdown again. And here's the good news. The good news it is as of this week, uh, this is data from Monday. You can see that the lockdown is working and you're seeing clinical cases drop in a parallel decrease in the wastewater signal. This is the other treatment plant and you can see the two treatment plants in that same region are showing very similar results and following the pattern very well. The other that we worked on is just north of Toronto and it's different in many ways because it doesn't have a sewage treatment plant. It just has big pipes and those big pipes go off to other places to do um, the, the treatment. And so the York region wanted to know what was happening in their region. And so what we started doing was sampling in some of the sewers. And you got to remember these are millions of liters per day and we're taking small samples to be able to predict what's going on in the community. So the majority of, of York drains over into Durham region and we have several sampling sites there. And then we have Vaughan that's draining into the, the Peel region. And York is very progressive. They, they've built a, a dashboard that they use internally to look at the data and to share it with their um, epidemiology and public health people. And so you can see exactly the same thing. In York region, we see the pattern uh, of the wastewater in the orange here fitting extremely well with the case report data. And in the, um, in the sewer, the boundary meter, this is actually a composite pipe. It's a very deep hole. It's very hard to sample. And you see a little bit more variability, but we see exactly the same sort of pattern uh, demonstrating that wastewater is very supportive. And remembering it's independent of those case data and those case data sometimes are a little bit lagged behind. So we also wanna look at what's going on in Waterloo, our own community here. And we have three different treatment plants that we're sampling here in Waterloo region. And so we're essentially covering 62% of the population in Waterloo region. 
And you see, we're fortunate in the Waterloo itself, the Waterloo treatment plant, the, we see the, the end of the second wave, and we really didn't get a really big um, sec second wave or third wave in the Waterloo region. We got a few outbreaks, uh, but now the concentrations in the wastewater and the cases are, are very, very low. In Kitchener, we had, uh, it's a bigger um, wastewater system. We see it dropping. We had some outbreaks and then we had a little bit of the third wave, but now we're seeing the um, signal declining. So we're in a very good position. But what about the variants? What, we know that the variants are coming in, what's happening with those? And so we were able to work with people at the uh, Tyson Grabber at um, CHEO in Ottawa and Rob Delatola and uh, at the University of Ottawa. And we were able to develop uh, uh, techniques to measure the B117 variant very early on. And so we were able to measure this in advance of the clinical um, and we were able to report almost daily back to them showing this increase in the B117 as it replaced the wild type of the virus. And it's interesting that the Waterloo is about three weeks delayed from the Peel region. And intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and when we compare our clinical to the B117 uh, variant, the UK variant, uh, we can see that it matches in the wastewater extremely well with the clinical cases that are reported. Uh, no, but but uh, wastewater is a very rapid way of, of doing this. So we've got lots of other new variants that are emerging. And right now in our lab, we're working hard to try to be able to come up with assays to be able to uh, measure them in uh, wastewater. We're looking at both the variants and the mutations, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to pick up and monitor and do surveillance for those communities uh, over the next uh, couple of months to be able to support that. The other uh, thing of the future is sequencing of the wastewater. We can extract that sample, we can detect, and we can look at the actual sequences. And we're working with people in uh, a variety of organizations, including some researchers here at the University of Waterloo, um, includes Trevor Charles and his group in the Department of Biology. And we're hoping that we're gonna be able to build a long-term um, program that is gonna support public health. So we got a tool that provides addition, additional tool for public health that informs them. We have independently tracked the trends. It allows for uh, detection of variants of concern and is potentially an early detection. So we think that uh, we are very proud of our team. I have a fabulous team at the University of Waterloo who's been supporting us. And um, we uh, look forward to continuing to serve our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Such exciting work. And I didn't mention this at the outset uh, of today's session, but I'm also a faculty member in biology. So it's tremendously exciting to see my colleague, Mark Servos, and, and you know the work that he's heading up here and what remarkable specificity and what a powerful uh, way of, of you know, um, surveying uh, the, the uh, virus and, and uh, the variants. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. And again, thank you. Uh, if you have uh, questions for Mark, you can uh, put them in the the chat line, and and we'll have uh, those questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, so now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Clark Baldwin to to make his presentation. Thank you, Bernie. And again, uh, thanks to everyone for the invite. Um, today we'd like to present on rapid antigen testing. Uh, on campus, it's an extra layer of protection in the fight against COVID-19. So uh, putting the uh, an agenda together, um, we are looking at what is the provincial antigen screening program is, and what is the participation that we can look at for this. An overview of the COVID-19 antigen rapid tests that currently are available. The clinical guidance on rapid antigen testing and how to get started with antigen screening on campuses. So the goals of the provincial antigen screening program are to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and to support essential and vulnerable workplaces, including universities and community colleges to safely stay open. We are going to enhance existing routine screening measures for individuals without symptoms, including employees and students in our priority settings. Allow for workplaces, including universities to proactively identify cases of the COVID-19, sorry about that, 
um, that may have otherwise been missed in supporting employees and students safely and business continuity in a variety of workplaces. I should note that the rapid antigen screening should not replace existing workplace infection prevention and control measures. So some key points to uh, consider for post-secondary institutions. So the following commentary is uh, to help university administrators protect students, faculty, staff, and adjacent campus communities to slow the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. Considerations should be made to implement a screening strategy uh, prior to the beginning of each term. And we're looking at uh, this current term as well as the fall 2021 term as uh, a key term to uh, implement this screening. We should evaluate implementing a universal serial screening testing strategy in the context of moderate, substantial, or high community transmission of COVID-19 if sufficient testing capacity is available. And all COVID-19 prevention plans, of course, should be developed in consultation, which we do all the time with local public health authorities and should include testing strategies and actions to support testing. And that is in regards to isolation and quarantine measures. So some background. So rapid, rapid antigen tests involve the use of antigen tests looking for proteins which come from the COVID-19 virus. The results are available in about 15 minutes at and at the same site, so you don't have to send them off for an analysis. This test can be useful for repeated screening of people without symptoms in campus settings, of course. Antigen tests, as some of us know, are not as accurate as PCR tests. So people who receive a positive result with an antigen test, but who are considered low risk, that is to say they have no symptoms, there's no exposure known to a confirmed case, do require a confirmation PCR test, the gold standard. Targeted testing with rapid antigen tests may improve accessibility to testing and help alleviate the burden on our community labs. But rapid antigen testing does not replace, as I said, the gold standard of lab-based PCR testing. They are complementary tools. So if we make some comparisons of the two tests of, for COVID-19, the rapid antigen screening, as you can see, it looks for proteins, as I discussed. We're screening asymptomatic individuals. We really need repeat root, routine screening at least twice a week. Once a week is fine if you have an, uh, a group that is being monitored very closely. The location is on site, results in 15 or 20 minutes, as I discussed. And the accuracy, unfortunately, there are higher rates of false positives and false negatives, but when you get a positive result, uh, you believe it and you, until such time as you can follow up with a PCR test to confirm. And for those of you who have had a PCR test, this is the one that you would experience at the hospitals or some of the testing centers in the community. Um, these tests show if someone is infected with COVID-19. Uh, it is used as a diagnosis, as I said, and symptomatic individuals and known close contacts are also tested via PCR. Locations are such as assessment centers and some pharmacies. And then they have, of course, to ship them to a lab for processing. Some pharmacies also offer rapid antigen screening tests that I'll talk about in a minute. The timing usually takes one or two days. So there's unfortunately a delay and this can lead to some measures not being uh, expediently taken until you get the results. But the accuracy is extremely accurate up to 98%. So background specific to the University of Waterloo. The University of Waterloo has been participating in the Ontario Post-Secondary Institution's Pilot Rapid Test Program since January 2021. This has now been completed. In that uh, initial pilot, the School of Optometry was first to initiate this pilot uh, with the assistance of uh, Campus Wellness and the University, and has performed uh, at least 1,100 tests with great success. Health Services, and themselves, we have performed over a thousand tests to focus groups, including uh, students, essential workers, field researchers, and on staff site of campus wellness. So looking at some of the experience of uh, pharmacies using these uh, rapid antigen testing programs, the, the data that uh, is presented here um, is from May 14th, and this started since uh, March 27th of this year. We can see that they've done um, in the last seven days uh, from May 14th, uh, about 370 tests. Uh, the cumulative tests, about tenfold on that. 
So in the last uh, seven days in May, they were out of 369 found five positive tests and the cumulative number of cases identified again, similar uh, 31. So looking at the type of tests that are available in Ontario, uh, provincially supplied, there are two types of uh, kits available. The Abbott PanBio that you might have heard about and we've been using and uh, a relatively new product, the BD Veritor, similar in its design, yet has some um, advantages that uh, are just becoming uh, evident to us. So the one that we're most experienced with is the uh, Abbott Labs PanBio COVID-19 antigen test. It is, of course, used for screening. We were doing nasal pharyngeal tests. This has now been relaxed to do nasal. Uh, the results, as I said, took uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Real world sensitivity is around 70% maximum, but really specific. So uh, that is an important part of any type of test. It's Health Canada approved, of course, and it is, to be honest, similar to a uh, pregnancy test or a rapid uh, strep throat test. You do a swab, uh, you would put buffer into the test tube, extract the solution, and then put it onto a cartridge, and you have a control and a test result. And if it's positive, you act on that. Uh, a similar product uh, that we're now looking at uh, at the University of Waterloo that's been supplied to us is the BD Veritor system, which uses a uh, analyzer uh, with also a cartridge test device that can be uh, inserted into the uh, analyzer. It also uses a nasal, deep nasal, combined throat, or bilateral nares. Again, the result takes about 15 minutes. The sensitivity is reported a little higher at 84%, but specificity up to 100%. So some new clinical guidance, when can antigen screening be used? Antigen screening will be considered in accordance, of course, with any of the Ministry of Health's COVID-19 guidance. The rapid antigen testing is used for screening purposes only, and we will not use it for diagnosing someone who has symptoms or exposure to COVID-19. And it can only be performed using a testing device currently that has been approved by Health Canada, but there are research devices going on at different uh, post-secondary institutions as well. So, Eligibility for our program, it would be people without symptoms, employees and students who have passed the initial standard screening that we're all conducting within our workplace. And it cannot be done uh, during a confirmed or suspected outbreak on campus. So clinical guidance, what are the appropriate specimen collection device uh, techniques for antigen screening? Rapid, rapid antigen testing can be performed using one of the following collection techniques. So the nasopharyngeal swab that uh, most people have uh, experienced and will remember makes your uh, eyes water and, and, and can be a little bit discomfort, has of course the highest sensitivity. Uh, a, a throat or nair would be the second one. We've used a, a combination of this, a deep nasal swab, but now there's relaxation so that we can do a nasal swabs. So who can perform the swabbing and testing? So just in the last few weeks, the Ministry of Health has addressed the resourcing challenges that have been expressed by the early adopters, which included post-secondary institutions and, and workplaces of rapid antigen testing by making regulatory changes to allow health professionals, other trained individuals, and individuals themselves to perform the uh, rapid antigen testing as part of the provincial antigen screening program. So of course, looking at the different types of uh, swabbing, the current testing processing can be done by a broad range of health professionals, other trained individuals, or by individuals testing themselves. So very important to this is as the results of a pause, all positive PCR tests are now being reported to local public health units through the provincial lab network. And this is what we do at our testing assessment centers. We do PCR tests and that reports automatically uh, are forwarded to the public health units. With regards to the uh, rapid antigen testing, the Ministry of Health is updating the program requirements so that organizations such as University of Waterloo providing rapid antigen screening will no longer have to report preliminary positive results to public health units, nor they, will they be required to report the results of the confirmatory lab-based PCR tests of the problems because this will occur through the Ministry uh, Public Health System. These changes, of course, will help encourage greater use of rapid testing by reducing the administrative burden 
and implementation barriers for all organizations and workplaces while still maintaining strong public health and safety measures. And that was uh, news release guidance uh, that just came out a couple of weeks ago. So, so when the University of Waterloo is looking at uh, site requirements for antigen screening, we look at having a rapid test lead, and that can be a director of care, an administrator, any other uh, individual that takes uh, the lead on this. Testing personnel uh, can be health professionals or other trained individuals, non-health, to perform swabbing, and even having now individuals swab themselves, as some individuals have experienced uh, either being in self-isolation, it's monitored, uh, over uh, video or being uh, seen at the airport uh, by an observer. Confirmatory testing, of course, uh, we are fortunate at the university, we have a testing assessment center that we would be able to collect the PCR swabs and have done this uh, offer uh, when there is a positive ramp, rapid antigen screening result. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, consideration of ongoing quality supporting capacity and there is a data reporting uh, requirement that uh, the ministry uh, is looking at because, uh, of course, we want to uh, have this as a good uh, provincial uh, program that would allow the, the province to continue to open up for business. So, in terms of uh, what will be communicated about antigen screening tests on campus, positive results, we'll tell an individual the positive results are preliminary and PCR testing is still required for confirmation. Uh, they must self-isolate and follow public health guidance until the result of any confirmatory lab-based PCR test uh, result is known. Um, this should be booked and performed within 24 hours. And the administrator of the rapid testing does not need, fortunately, to report the preliminary positive results to the local public health unit, as I've discussed. A negative test result, uh, we would tell the individual that the result is negative, but a false negative is possible. An individual's course should continue to follow all infection prevention control measures that are already in place. Now, there's some questions about, well, do these help with the variance of concern? As uh, Mark had discussed uh, about uh, wastewater, the PanBio COVID test uh, has been proven to detect the UK variant. Other variants are also suspected of being detected based on the way the tests work, and that's been confirmed for the BD Veritor test. The test results, uh, sorry, the test detects the nucleocapsid protein rather than the spike protein where those variant mutations occur, and thus would not be expected to be affected by the differences in variant lineages. So now, of course, COVID-19 vaccines, very important, timely topics. How does this fit in in clinical guidance with rapid tests? So vaccinated individuals should not be excluded from rapid antigen screening initiatives as is unknown at this time, but they can still transmit COVID-19 despite being vaccinated. Individuals who have received a COVID-19 vaccine, regardless of whether they receive one or two doses, are still, still able to receive an accurate result from a rapid antigen test. And based on a review of available evidence and expert guidance, regular testing will remain an important part even after individuals have received the COVID-19 vaccines. And of course, I do believe the rapid antigen testing is expected to continue for the foreseeable future. So the next steps that are currently underway at the University of Waterloo to implement a rapid antigen screening program, uh, we have reviewed the provincial antigen screening documents. There's review of the onboarding guides, training modules, and go live checklist. The procedures for using the rapid antigen test, we have experience and have uh, completed that. Uh, we're identifying a, t a testing lead who will oversee implementation of antigen screening. And of course, the ordering and receiving antigen tests following instructions for our particular structure, uh, sector are very important uh, to this program. So as we uh, continue on this venture, uh, we'll move away hopefully from the using of masks and other guidance. Uh, of course, masks are uh, still an option for anyone, but hopefully as we continue to return to a time when we will be similar to that, which was 18 months ago, uh, our campus and our lives will be uh, much more enriched in the experiences of being at the university. So I thank you for uh, the option of presenting, thanks. Clark, thank you so much, and I really like that you ended up on that campus slide. Obviously, the work that you and your team uh, are carrying out uh, so vitally, uh, it really touches all of us personally, 
uh, in terms of the Waterloo uh, community, as indeed we look at ramping up activity, uh, certainly this fall. So thank you so much. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to move into the Q&A section of today's program, and we're nicely on time here, so we do have a time for uh, the audience to ask our, our three presenters questions, and I'll invite Sue, yeah, and Mark to, to uh, turn on their cameras, and I'll invite audience members to uh, put their questions into the chat line, and if you want to direct your question to a particular panelist, please go ahead and, and do so. And so I'm just gonna look, I'm not seeing uh, any questions yet in the chat line. So maybe I will uh, start off with uh, some of my own, uh, three uh, fantastic presentations. And uh, so maybe I, I start off with Sue. And uh, Sue, you know, you spoke to the challenges in terms of, you know, in, in this pandemic era, conducting interviews remotely, right? And um, you know, that you had tried some clunky platforms and, you know, the challenge was to get to something that would give you some more meaningful interactions with, with the individuals that you were communicating with. Um, you know, are there, I mean, so what aspects are still lacking, I guess, in terms of this communication? You know, what areas um, of research maybe or development uh, could address maybe some of the shortcomings that still exist? Okay, so that's a little bit out of my league as an economist. Um, okay. Psychology, you know, or, you know, human behavior would, would know more. But, yeah. um, you know, clearly uh, people say different things when they're on video than when they are in person. I mean, if, if you see these funny TV shows where they show you weird things that have happened to people on video, um, you know, maybe people are more uninhibited because they're at home or sometimes they don't even realize their camera is on. Um, so, uh, it's different though. I mean, I think the university will have to update its procedures because, you know, when we were talking about doing video interviews and using online verbal consent, you know, which would be recorded this, oh, no, 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 you have to do a piece of paper as well. And, uh, you know, to me, that made little sense, um, you know, it, it's just that we don't adapt very easily. We're, we're so concerned about, uh, you know, safety and privacy, et cetera, that uh, we try to follow the existing procedure. And I think probably COVID has just shown us we can't do that. We have to adapt on the fly often. Thank you. Um, you know, you've identified or you've, you've, you've studied sort of forgotten groups and uh, groups that, you know, uh, have really been marginalized or, you know, that, that the inequities of the pandemic have struck. And um, I'm just wondering, are there, are there, you know, yet other groups that, that um, would be, you know, sort of top of the list to um, sort of, you know, study or, or interact and, and sort of survey next? Okay, so in our own work, one of the Another project that we would like to engage in also related to COVID is to deal with um, uh, seniors who are living with dementia. Uh, we know that they've been very adversely affected for the ones who are living in care in long term care facilities, you know, because of infection control limitations, et cetera. Um, so, you know, one of the things in the literature is that, you know, we should definitely try and facilitate people living at home as long as possible. Um, and there may be technology assists that will help them to do that. Um, so there's been a lot of studies done of, you know, what kind, what kinds of technology assistance um, people, you know, would, would find useful, but quite often they don't ask the individuals themselves. Uh, and so that's an important thing to do. I mean, the individuals living with dementia probably have different, well, we know that they have different priorities than their caregivers. Um, and uh, that has to be taken into account, but at the same time, um, working with individuals living with dementia is quite challenging. Um, you know, not only because, you know, we know that they have cognitive limitations on what they can do, but those also may vary from time to time. You know, there might be certain times of the day when they're well able to uh, tell you about the thoughts and feelings and then other times when it's not appropriate. Um, so I'm sure there are other groups like that. 
Thanks, Sue. Um, uh, for Mark, um, in terms of, of the specific specificity of, of detecting um, variants, um, you know, you, you've talked about maybe some of the common variants that, that have emerged that, you know, make the headlines in the news and, and being able to detect their emergence um, through the wastewater analysis. I'm wondering, have you, you know, have you come across some some novel variants that, you know, aren't making headlines or, um, you know, that, that pop up for a while and, and maybe they don't, you know, have some sort of selective advantage? I mean, are there interesting uh, variants, I guess, that, that could bear some follow up? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the big question, right? Um, and uh, the interesting thing about wastewater is that it includes that whole community. So you're not doing individual people, but you're, you're, you're doing the whole thing. Um, but then taking that apart, the bioinformatics of trying to separate that and identify each of those is very, very complex. So we've been uh, working with uh, the public health agency and they've been uh, sequencing the, the data, the samples from all of our regions for the last little while. And we, and we pick up um, all, all kinds of different uh, variants. Um, and there, there are literally hundreds of different kinds of variants out there, but the ones that we're concerned about are the variants of concern that can have an impact on how we manage the pandemic, right? And that, that's the real challenge is, is getting the information that's not scientifically interesting, but actionable for the public health people. How can we make that information useful to them so that it can support their decision making? So, yeah, um, and I think uh, the work that Trevor Charles is doing in the biology department is fantastic. Um, and he's looking at how we can detect some of those and targeting those sequences so that we can be um, more aware of what the public health is going to face in, in the future. Exactly. I mean, Clark was referring to, you know, some of the, the lab based uh, testing that's being developed and. Uh, Trevor and his group, absolutely, and that will be at the sequence level. So, uh, very excited to to see what comes out of uh, that initiative. Um, so, so Mark, you know, you you studied wastewater for for many many years, and now getting very specific in terms of you know down to the sequence level. Is this type of surveillance here to stay? Um, do you think? I mean, well, I think it was that? already it was already here. Um, so um, they've been monitoring things like polio for a long time in oh. wastewater. Okay. And uh, so it, uh, in some ways, it's not a novel idea. It's a, it's an idea that we adapted for the pandemic, and we had all the right tools. So we think that in the long term, the wastewater is going to become an important surveillance tool. Um, not exactly sure how yet, but I think what we've learned in this pandemic, and there's so many labs across Canada and around the world doing it, we've learned so much that. It's going to be a useful tool and it's going to be able to pick up a whole variety of things in different communities and think about the communities that don't have the kind of resources that we have. Uh, if you can go into a communities that don't can't, you can't go out and sample everybody or there's a reluctance to be sampled. You can sample wastewater and get a feeling over time of what's happening in that community or different kinds of communities. So it has important implications for different parts of the world and how it can be applied um, to support um, public health action, I guess. Yeah, so so even though, you know, the testing, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, been here, you know, uh, for many years, um, th that sort of broadening and, and, and um, making that more widespread, I guess, would be, a goal moving forward. Um, Clark, I'm wondering if you could, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, we talked, you talked a bit about positive results uh, for the, for the rapid testing, but what about negatives and, you know, maybe a false sense of security, um, you know, with a negative test? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, as we have seen with uh, PCR testing, both at our testing assessment center and also uh, at the community testing center at 50 Westmount, uh, Individuals will sometimes, of course, want to be tested before big events such as Thanksgiving or returning home at the end of the term uh, because they're entering into a new environment. And so there's always that concern that their actions will will change and their and their uh, precautions because of a false sense that um, I don't have it and I won't spread it. Um, I think that uh, that is 
something that we have to consider with uh, rapid testing, antigen testing as well. Uh, so what we would, of course, expect is that uh, because it's a lower sensitivity test compared to PCR and, and uh, they're quick and cost effective, we would use more frequent testing. So individuals should basically live their life like if they're negative with rapid testing, not to change their actions, continue to do the good things that we're all doing uh, with regards to uh, you know reducing the risk of COVID transmission. But if someone becomes positive with a rapid test, they change their actions and, and they, uh, of course, uh, confirm that it's a real test. And this will have a, a great impact on the community um, because we will pick up something we, we didn't otherwise believe uh, to be the case, and and we'll get ahead of the of outbreaks as opposed to just being uh, uh, reactive and and sort of uh, you know let the uh, if you like uh, outbreak take its course, and that's that's very hard on a, any institution trying to manage day to day operations, both for the individuals and of course for for their community. So I think that uh, once this becomes something that is uh, more to our lifestyle for the next few months, so hopefully into the fall term, um, this will become um, sort of a checkup and a fine tuning of uh, and you can see the applicability in different environments uh, when individuals are coming together or traveling. Um, this may be very important as a way to ensure that we know because unless you're symptomatic, you're probably not going to uh, seek uh, some type of screening program, um, you really want a diagnosis when you're positive. And then to differentiate it from things like influenza, which is just around the corner, and other rotavirus and other types of uh, viruses that we've done a good job on because of all the uh, cleaning procedures and you know wearing masks and, and PPE. But this is really going to have an effect as we move into the flu season again and how best to manage those. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, a question from the audience for uh, Sue. Will the study on the impacts of lockdown continue beyond the year? I'm thinking particularly about following the long term impacts on children, especially girls in the area of education. Um, yeah, thanks. So this, this study was funded by UNICEF um, and it was done in collaboration with a big team of, of uh, colleagues. Uh, at the moment, it's not ongoing, but yes, I think it would be really interesting to look at this. Um, and I think one area that we've learned during COVID is that it's not enough just to have cross-section surveys, that um, longitudinal surveys of the same individual are very useful, you know, because um, we, we know, for example, with long COVID, you know, this uh, syndrome where people have suffered from COVID, and then 18 months later are still experiencing really bad symptoms um, that we know that we will need to follow up on those individuals. And, you know, because some of the effects from COVID may not manifest themselves for a long time. So one of the things that happened in Canada is we did have a long national longitudinal survey of, uh, young, of young people um, that was linked with the labor force survey, but it was discontinued. Um, and so I think we are realizing, you know, we're now missing information and we will need to do these kind of longitudinal surveys because they can suddenly provide valuable information that we need that you can't, uh, you know, suddenly uh, reconstitute if you have let the systems break down. So, Sue, uh, well, and anybody could uh, uh, jump in on this one, but. Uh, another question, you know, have any research projects focused on impact of COVID-19 measures in Ontario and residents' well-being? You know, there have been several conversations about the multiple lockdowns enforced by the provincial government and the perceived effectiveness of these. Okay, if it's okay, I'll go first and then ask my colleagues to jump in. So, yes, there is a tremendous amount of research on this. I mean, particularly uh, people are super interested in mental health. Um, and there is a lot of uh, evidence that, you know, people have had adverse effects on mental health and it's been particularly serious in adolescents uh, and young people because they are at the phase in their life, you know, where they are programmed biologically almost to want to reach out, to communicate with new people, to undertake new experiences. Um, and they have been, you know, just very much uh, what they are geared to do 
um, is not is no longer possible. So, uh, yes, um, and, and if, you know, if you want to look at a, a sort of resource to get some of this information, um, as, as uh, Bernie mentioned, I'm a theme lead for the Can COVID organization. So it's HTTPS um, can COVID C A N C O V I D dot C A. And uh, it's a link to many of the resources. So, yeah, I'd encourage you to follow that up. Thank you. Question for Mark from the audience. To what degree can these methods isolate small areas? Or is really I or really ideal for tracing trends in large areas? I think you're muted, Mark. It can be applied to uh, individual buildings, even um, in small areas. And it becomes an ethics question as well. You have to have that kind of approval in place. Um, but there, uh, people are monitoring uh, old folks' homes um, in buildings where they think that there's infections. Um, and so then you can work your way um, back down the sewer shed or up the sewer shed to try to use it as a tool to try to isolate um, various areas of infection uh, or changes in, in where the infection or the kinds of variants that might occur in different parts of your communities uh, might be. So it's a very powerful tool, but it's a new tool. So there's a lot of science that still needs to be done. Um, and we're kind of learning how to do a lot of this. Um, people describe it as building an airplane while you're trying to fly it. And uh, that's basically what we've been trying to do and uh, working with uh, a network within Ontario that was set up by the Ontario government um, that has 13 or 14 university labs now doing wastewater surveillance and looking at all these opportunities. So yeah, you can you can do it. We even looked at the University of Waterloo and whether it was possible. Um, it's very difficult to do on our campus, um, but it is possible. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, um, so I invite the audience to add any more questions that they might have in the Q and A uh, line. Uh, it, and and while we're waiting for uh, some more audience questions, I have another one for you, Clark. So you referred to now kind of an easing up, I guess, in terms of how we we collect samples for for testing. Uh, and and so I'm wondering, does this how you collect the sample does that have any effect on uh, false positive or negative rates? So potentially it would, and uh, there is some. Uh, we've seen this with some of the. Um, uh, individuals who have traveled internationally coming to Canada have been in uh, self isolation and then getting uh, a test done maybe in the uh, 14 day uh, self isolation time of day eight now. Um, if it's not observed correctly, there is that risk. So, in, in the program that we're looking at, uh, definitely, you know, having uh, a nasal test at 1.5 centimeters into the NAIR uh, observed is really going to ensure that we don't get into that. But of course, uh, that's always a concern um, and it's gonna be a, a balance uh, benefit, you know, getting more compliance and individuals uh, receptive to, to not having that higher sensitivity. Uh, again, I think the frequency of the testing and, and it being done correctly, um, and, and we're pro providing a little extra uh, oversight than maybe some individuals that you would just hand the kids to uh, and and uh, in larger communities and just uh, go uh, through uh, that and then not having any uh, obligatory uh, reporting, we're able to at least uh, convey a positive result and work with an individual in the 15 minutes that they're spending with us uh, for rapid testing and then provide them some counseling and guidance that you may not see with just uh, purchasing tests at pharmacies and then taking them home. Same way with pregnancy tests and other rapid rapid tests. It's not about physicians uh, and uh, doing the tests and or nurses. I have to give a shout out to our nurses who and, uh, you know, campus wellness who have done a great job in this and looking at optometry. Optometry has done a great job uh, overseeing this uh, independent of the medical uh, part of health services, um, showing um, that groups on campus can do this. And we're encouraging uh, groups to look at this as being part of their uh, getting back uh, to uh, a return, true return to campuses. So that is a risk, um, but again, I think we can mitigate it by having uh, good oversight and that's uh, where Kate Windsor and, and, and others will really uh, help in this uh, process to make sure that that program uh, is done correctly. 
um, the results in the state show that it can be done really well. Uh, and you're now, uh, I think, going to have a, a larger uh, appetite for this type of testing. Thanks. And I think sort of self swabbing, and, and I'm just wondering, is that is it going to move more that way? And and you know, we have make sure people are properly trained to self swab, and and I mean, as as we kind of build it into the routine, you know, of of how we move forward, living, of course, with COVID for many years to come, one would think. Um, yeah, I think so. Potentially, especially in the middle of the night, someone gets uh, concerned. There may be appetite for symptomatic. I mean, most of the work that was done with the rapid antigen testing and the results are on symptomatic individuals. We've taken the approach because we don't want to miss symptomatic individuals at at home testing. Uh, so that's why we've, I think, looked at the asymptomatic. As as Mark was talking about, um, I think that you know a good example might be using rapid testing in combination with. You know, uh, testing wastewater from particular areas of a of the institution, and then getting ahead of what's happening both uh, for the individual level, but also from the aggregate level, is really going to be a, a potential of uh, great work. So, uh, small small steps, and of course, uh, get vaccinated. We're strongly encouraging vaccinations, and uh, but but respecting that uh, not everyone is going to be or may be able to get a vaccine, and. Uh, I, I'm assured that uh, we'll work very closely to make sure that uh, that will be taken into account um, as we uh, move towards, especially the fall term. Thanks. And so we have a couple more questions now in the Q&A line. Uh, so Clark, this one for you, how widespread will rapid antigen testing get in the fall? Students and residents, or is that too invasive? No, I think the offer is uh, will be uh, to everyone. Um, we're looking at a smaller scale, you know, ideally you'd like to have a, you know, 10% of the pot of the group that you're looking at having an uptake, but higher, of course, would be better. Um, so that's what we're looking at uh, in the summer. It's a quieter time traditionally anyway. Uh, the fall, uh, again, uh, if we have uh, great numbers that we're all anticipating and, and people on campus, um, I think that you'll see uh, a greater appetite and the universities. Uh, are all looking at this and looking for guidance also from federal and provincial public health uh, agencies. But yeah, I th uh, the numbers will increase. And so as you increase the uh, testing and the frequency of the testing in the rapid antigen uh, styles, you'll see much better results. And the last chat question is to you, uh, Mark. Have there been instances where the wastewater data shows a much higher incidence of COVID than reported cases? Um, yeah, the, the, there's quite a bit of variability, but there's an example in the um, one of the data sets from Ottawa where they predicted um, in with wastewater that there, there was going up and they didn't see the corresponding clinical cases, but what was interesting is that they saw the hospitalizations uh, about a week later. Mm. So um, we don't fully understand COVID, <laughs> we don't fully understand what happens when it gets into a sewer. And uh, so there's a lot of research still to do, but it is definitely a, um, a good tool. And certainly within those large communities that we've been working with, and even Waterloo, which is fairly small, we're getting very good results that, that track. And so if you change your testing, in those periods where your testing is changing or, or there's changes in how the positivity is interpreted, the wastewater remains independent and a supportive tool. Great. Well, that is a great point to end off, a very optimistic uh, point to end off the Q&A session. So thank you so much uh, for everybody's questions and, and for the great responses from our panelists. And so uh, we're coming to the end of the time for our session uh, today. And so I would like to thank each of our panelists, Sue Horton, Mark Servos, and uh, Clark Baldwin for taking the time uh, to speak with us today. I'd also like to thank each of you, all the audience members, for taking the time to join us and, and hope you enjoyed learning about and discussing uh, this very important, very timely topic. We look forward to seeing you at our next research talks. And please feel free to register for the next session in the series Teaching and Learning which will be held on June the 17th on the A Year of COVID-19 webpage. Thank you all, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you.